and I'm happy to be here to facilitate this session specifically. And um, I would kindly ask the participants in this panel, that would be Mr. David Ngogi, Ms. Annie Mwangi, I hope she's here now, um, Mr. Oki Sere Ojapat, and Favor, Mr. Favor Rohio. Kindly switch on your videos so that we could begin our discussions. Nice to see you, Favor. Um, Favor was my student, so I'm particularly very happy to see him. Mr. Ngogi, very welcome. Nice to see you. Um, Mr. Oki Segere, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing your name correctly. You will correct me once you introduce yourself. Um, okay, so I'd, I'd, given that we are running a bit behind, I'd ask you to briefly introduce yourself each. Um, just introduce yourself and share with us um, the work that you have been doing in the SME sector in the last, um, let's say about 36 months or so, just a summary of that. Maybe you could take two, three minutes to just start us off. Um, Ms. Tanguge, you have had a very long morning, so I would I kindly ask you to please do start us off. All right, uh, thank you everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Terry. Um, so um, David Ngoge, I'm the CEO of uh, Paytree Group, uh, where we support uh, small and medium enterprises to be able to take advantage of uh, uh, digital payment and e-commerce. And we've helped uh, most of these businesses, you know, most of the conversations have been uh, revolving around how uh, people in the agriculture sector and SMEs in the agriculture sector can take uh, advantage of digital skills. And so we've been able to provide a lot of training and uh, a platform for them to be able to uh, not only position their goods uh, for sale locally, but also internationally. And uh, that's the work that we've been doing, like you mentioned, the last time. Thank you for having me. Okay, thank you so much um, for, for that introduction. Um, Favor, would you kindly go next? Yes, um, good afternoon and good morning, depending on where you're joining in from. So thank you very much, Dr. Nguti. Um, I had the privilege of being in her class twice. Um, so <laughs> it was a real pleasure um, from marketing strategy where she dived in and she's very passionate about to services marketing, which tie into two key parts of what we do. Um, so at Mochak Group Limited, as you can see on the right over there, um, where we are making different products that are organic spices and sauces, where we have a garlic and a ginger sauce, um, a hot spice sauce and a hot and sweet sauce. And uh, we are making them majorly um, for spice lovers, food lovers in general, um, for the Kenyan and African market at large. Um, we haven't done exports except individual customers who will travel in and out with our products, but we have been selling across the country. In the last 86 months, we have been making the sauces and spices for customers and businesses and restaurants alike. Um, during COVID, things were very tough, as it was for many businesses. Uh, we ended up pivoting into mushrooms as well, which we were doing to just meet demand and just keep the business going, uh, which is an interesting journey for us. Um, so now it opened up avenues where we're looking into value addition for mushrooms. Um, so that's a bit about the last 36 months. So thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that introduction. Mr. Okisegere. Thanks. Um, you are right. Just pronounce it Okisegere. And if you stray, don't worry. <laughs> but of life, you can actually call me OJ. I work for Fresh Produce Consortium of Kenya, basically an association that brings together the value chain actors within the fresh produce industry in the domestic market, in the regional market, and in the international market. What we've done with the SMEs is basically be able to move them from where they were, basically as starters, and now be able to export globally. So we're busy ensuring that uh, Kenyans can participate in fruits, vegetable hubs, spices, flowers, and anything agribusiness into the global market, working very closely with the rest of with government and many other people in the globe, just to ensure that the SMEs basically transform this world in terms of agribusiness. So that's who we are, and we are willing and ready to support anybody who's ready, anybody who has a dream to become an exporter or become an agribusiness expert. We're here to support them. We're here to give them that that is required. We're here to ensure that that happens. And then I have this, I always say, the available mouths in the world to eat are steadily going high in terms of the numbers. Mm -hmm. The arable land is becoming smaller. There are for need for technology innovation. Just ensure that we get clear 
that we can be able to feed. Our vision is very simple that every Kenyan, every person in Africa will be able to have, uh, to be assured of the next meal, which is not happening today. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, OJ. Um, we are looking forward to in enhanced um, engagement with you in this particular session. Next, I would like to kindly ask Maggie Mutesi to join the panel. Um, I'm hoping that this is not too much of a shocker. Please turn your video if you can and briefly introduce yourself. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nguti. Can you see me? Yes, I can. Okay. My name is Maggie Umotesi. I am a financial journalist, uh, but I also run um, publication, Mansa Media, and uh, correspond for CNN in the West African region. Uh, it's great to be with you today. And uh, yeah, I look forward to, to the panel. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I, I look forward to getting insights from you concerning this whole discussion on skills development and basically how we can um, guess improve ourselves and, and then take advantage of this increasing market. So for now, though, I'd like you to kindly share with us the gaps that you have encountered or you see currently being experienced. Um, and by gaps, I, I would like you to kind of emphasize the competency and skill gaps that you see amongst the SME sector, especially in the agribusiness sector, that you think um, are currently plaguing our our continent, now that you're not just talking about Kenya or East Africa. Um, I'd, I'd like to hear your insights on that. Maybe we could start with um, OJ. Thank Gavin. you so much. That's, that's fine with me. Um, number one, I think what we need to know, uh, I'll be very straight, very blunt, mm -hmm. and hope that this is able to move this conversation to the next level. Mm -hmm. What we have not done in Africa is we've not taken advantage of who we are, the location that we are in this country, first of all. So the first challenge is we are not ourselves. We still want to live in a colonial era where we're not getting independent of what we need to do. So what we are looking at here now is to ensure that first, the, we need to ensure that our SMEs get to know what is required in the marketplace. And what's required in the marketplace is the product availability or the services available consistently and over a determined time. We are in a situation where we, we still, the SMEs are not very consistent in terms of the supply of services or goods into the market. We are not time conscious when it comes to delivery and for that reason become very unpredictable. Of course, then we have no knowledge of what is required. Neither are we working hard to get that knowledge simplified and chewed in a much more easier way. When I'm looking at here in the African case, we do not know, we do not seem to know the language in terms of the, the, the non-tariff barriers and the phytosanitary barriers that have really frustrated uh, business in the agri business section. In the industry that I stay, it's very simple. When you go to the global market, they'll be asking you one thing, do you have any certification? And the question will be which certification? When I come back home, I realized that colleges and universities, and in this case, Strathmore, may, may need to look at what kind of certification courses practical that are out here, because compliance to standard is not about academia. Compliance to standard is about practi the practical experience in the marketplace. I need to look at traceability. I need to look at the certification in terms of global gap, in terms of am I able to account for that product and am I able to place it in the shelves at the right time? Am I able to detect the maturity? Am I able to detect the timing? And of course, the issues of logistics and most importantly, that we need to be able to know who is our competitor. After all this has been done, can we be able to communicate? And I'm sure I'm happy that Maggie is here. The most critical thing is how do we communicate how do we communicate? Africans are poor in terms of communication, branding our product, talking about it. We are not able to do that. So the biggest challenge that we have at the moment is that whereas we want to do business, whereas we think we are in business, we are, have deficiency in terms of understanding the market requirements and we rely on internet. And sometimes I keep telling people, Google is as good as who put that information there. So if I put a 
wrong information, that's exactly what people are getting on the other side. Then we need to be practical and proactive and we need to work on uh, coming together. We need to learn to come together to be able to take advantage. For example, markets require certain volumes to be supplied and SMEs may not be able to have capacity to raise those volumes. We need to come together and agree we need to supply a quarter of 100 tons. How do we divide that among ourselves to be able to push to the marketplace? So at the moment, the gaps are that we are not very sure what are the standards. We don't want to follow, and we have deficiency of technical people in Africa that are able to take you through, basically hand-holding an SME to the end. So many SMEs get frustrated along the way, and we have a necessary competition because we want to compete. The multinationals that have been there many years, instead of taking a single approach, appreciating where we are starting from, but appreciating that it is practical to take baby steps from one corner to another to ensure this is happening. And therefore, um, for the fresh produce industry, fruits, vegetable, herbs, and spices, people do not even know what they need to do to become exporters, and yet they want to compete the ones that are here. So it's important that we get to know what do I want, what product, what services, how do I package it and brand it, and how do I communicate in clarity? That will be able to help us to, to move forward. So that is my initial thought. And therefore, just to let you say, can we stop copy pasting and be ourselves and learn to listen, learn to innovate, learn to cooperate and learn to work together? That is my initial submission. Okay, thank you very much. You somehow have summarized um, content that it takes me about a whole semester to teach in less than five minutes. Thank you very much for starting us off in that particular way. Um, and from what I have heard, um, there is a huge dose of ignorance, I guess, I guess in terms of how we are going about doing business. There's a lot of copy pasting, as you are saying, we are basically taking models that you don't completely understand and trying to implement them. Um, and of course, um, from what I've also picked up the, the whole importance of having um, technical experts who are available to handhold people and take them through the process and help them figure out their journey. Um, Favor, you have been doing this for quite a while and um, it's, it's one of the things that I quite admire about you. One of the things that I'd like to hear from you then is what gaps have you experienced or have you seen um, in your journey as an entrepreneur? in this particular space? What gaps in terms of competencies and skills do you think need to be filled? Great, thank you very much. Um, it's interesting hearing what uh, Mr. Oki Segere is mentioning about the pro value addition space, especially for SMEs from the perspective of exportation. Um, so I'll start from the local space and listening to the previous session where one of the one of the attendees of the conference mentioned a challenge being accessing, you know, CAB certification. They talked about the fee of a little over 5,000 shillings for SMEs and mm -hmm. such. Um, the, the challenges with those is not that, you know, there's not enough skill set. Um, the, within the government, you have um, Kenya Industrial Research and Development Institute, and they work directly with SMEs to help them standardize their formulas, their products, especially when it's value addition for agriculture. The challenge is that there's not enough knowledge, awareness for such government opportunities, and they're actually not as expensive. Um, some trainings are as little as 10,000, and they'll train the lead member of your production team or the person re running production who can train the rest of the team. And then they'll train you with in regards to formulas and processes that can be utilized in standardizing your project, your product to, to comply with CAB certification because the training they'll formulate for the business uh, meets the specific standard that the business would comply with. So some of those aspects are the reasons why SMEs are challenged because if you're able to do that and you get your CAB certification and you comply with it over a period of time, two, three years, it's easy for you to fast track um, platforms like HASP certification, especially if your facilities are conducive. Um, and then if you're able to do that, able to work with organizations like Mr. Kisa Garris and others, um, for instance, we're part of Kenya Association of Manufacturers and we're part of forums where we're working towards um, export compliance. So what happens is through a proven track record, they're able to match us with industry players and participants. We're able to help improve our standards, processes, and, 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 and our, our production systems to comply with export, exportation. So for instance, um, 
we buy some of our fresh produce from smallholder farmers and suppliers. So a key aspect we're working towards is ensuring traceability, because since our products are organic, we need to make sure that we can account for every last gram down to the source where the farmer got it or supplier got it. So that means internal processes and system, systems and then working with experts for the training. So these are things that I think um, do exist, but there's, a, there's not enough ecosystem knowledge for it uh, because until you know, um, some SMEs and or you could even say startups in the value addition space proactively apply themselves, you'll never get to know. For instance, with facilities, is the government facility called in Kenya Industrial Estates, which is a, an avenue we're working towards, where as you grow, you're able to access um, industrial facilities across the country that you can use for production. Um, you know, with, for instance, where we do our production is in Kikuyu, because when we started formalizing our, 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 our business and after we began r and and we were looking at scalability, we were looking at production space. Now, within the first 15 kilometers of Nairobi, production space for a conducive um, manufacturing business is very expensive as an SME, considering, um, you know, I'm a young person, I just finished, you know, my coursework and everything for university. So four years ago, I was joining university. So when I'm joining university, the, the cost of facilities are prohibitive, right? Especially when you're looking at starting with, you know, savings as a team. Um, so we partnered with Kenya Agricultural Livestock and Research Organization who gave us facilities in their Muguga facility in Kikuyu. So with that, we're able to work on a partnership that's mutually beneficial and we're able to get production facilities that can scale us mid short term. So th these are efforts that I think startups and SMEs can pursue to grow because it a lot of these things do exist. There's just not a lot of ecosystem interconnectedness. Um, the, the, the chairman of uh, Kenya Innovation Agency previously mentioned how they have a fund for, for S, SMEs and startups. I think a lot of what the government needs to work towards is aggregating their resources for SMEs. That's one. A second thing they need to do also is offer a lot of in-kind services. So, you know, if it's, you know, um, Kenya, Industrial Life, Kenya Industrial Research Institute, Offering some of these services on credit, or offering them some of these services on a pay on a you know on a payment plan for startups, or you have a lot of women in business organizations where women are trying to formalize their businesses and they have the ideas. I've met people who are making you know we have um, Madam Ma Maggie Mutesi, and it, one thing that's big in Uganda that I really love is ginat sauce, groundnut sauce, and. Um, and one thing that's big there is, um, you know, they'll take the groundnuts from different farmers, process them and make them into a sauce. And it's big in Uganda, big in Western province. And the people actually do know how to make it. And where we get ours are from some family friends who make it. And I'm sure they have the capability just from the proven knowledge. We've been taking their sauce for the last 10 years and we've been okay. And they have the knowledge to make it, but what's not there is a form of training to commercialize it. And that's what's needed um, and uh, platforms um, to do that as well. So thank you. Okay, thank you very much um, for, for those amazing points and also for helping us go into the other point of discussion in terms of how can the government, how can academia um, help in filling in these gaps. And one of the things that you've brought about is the whole consolidation of information, which you said is a gap. The fact that we are doing such amazing things, but it is just not being communicated. We are literally hiding our light under bushels. Yeah. Um, and so we need to better communicate it and consolidate the information to make it easily accessible. Thank you for, for that particular um, sharing. Devi, I I'd like you to share what you are doing in Patri and possibly the gaps that um, the gaps that of, of, of in terms of competencies and skills that you have encountered and possibly even just again taking the same approach that Favor took, um, how you think those gaps can be filled. All right, uh, thank you again. Um, so at Patri, uh, our main product is actually called Advili, which is a platform where we allow uh, small businesses to be able to start selling online quite easily. I mean, in just like five weeks, you should be able to start selling online across uh, your own shop and maybe on social media. And uh, by interacting with all these different entrepreneurs that uh, we've worked with over the years, some of the things that we've realized is there are quite some gaps, especially when it comes to they understand the digital skills. Um, most of these entrepreneurs, uh, you find that for them, uh, once say you produce uh, a product, 
then the next step becomes how do I get it out to the market? And for most of them, that becomes pretty much the end of the journey. So you're quite good at the farm level, but when it comes to the point of actually getting the product out there where it would add more value now to you and actually earn you the shilling, that becomes the limitation. And uh, when it comes to how we've been able to help them, we all actually do organize things like uh, webinars and forums where we're able to teach them how to use the different platforms, how to use e-commerce to be able to uh, reach a bigger market. Uh, with uh, some of the things that uh, Emily was talking that about in the AF, AFC FTA, uh, mm -hmm. it means they're opening up uh, the African continent for more businesses to be able to transact across the border. But it's no longer an issue of transacting just within the country. And by a lot of these agribusinesses starting to adopt technology that can actually help them to transact, not just within their locality, because most of the time their product is actually uh, taken by market intermediaries, what we commonly call the brokers. Uh -huh. And that actually affects uh, their margins because the brokers will buy the products at very low costs and actually do the marking up. But by taking advantage of platforms uh, like Anzili, we are able to let these businesses reach the consumer directly. Uh, just uh, a few weeks back, we were the uh, one business that actually uh, produces, I mean, buys from farmers and sells their products, products through e-commerce. And they've been doing quite good turnovers. And a lot of people, you know, when you need that fresh produce, you either go to your local Maboga, uh, or you actually make a trip to your supermarket. But beyond that, if the, the product from the farmer is not available you know, in those two avenues, then it's very hard for the farmer to actually ever get to you. So the, the farmer is limited to actually just making the sale through those two avenues. But by getting their product out uh, you know, through e-commerce uh, and marketing it through social media, then the farmer is able to get a bigger reach. They're able to you know, get access to a person who previously would not have known where to find them. So it's quite important for a lot of people and the people in the agribusiness to begin taking advantage of these platforms and these technologies that have become more accessible. Um, because when it comes to things like bundles, I mean, these days they are quite cheap. For as little as 20 shillings, you're able to uh, begin uh, posting your products online and getting them to in more people's eyes. And by using a platform like YouTube, you can learn better ways of farming. So a lot of these digital skills are actually available and for the cheap. You even don't need to be in a classroom set up to be able to learn a lot of things. Learning things like weather patterns, when is it going to rain? You know, Google Weather will provide you a lot of information that is quite useful. So when all these things are put together, it provides a lot of value for that person in the agribusiness sector to be able to not only start their business, but also grow it and grow it even beyond the borders to a level where now the business is actually more well known. Okay, thank you very much for that, um, Devi. Um, it sounds as though the lack of, I guess, to some extent, market knowledge, how to move their products from their firms, from their um, factories to the market itself is one of the things that needs to grow. And also just digital skills to take advantage of these 21st century solutions that are available, but are just not being taken fully advantage of. Um, Maggie. Uh, I'd like you to share with us your insights. I know you've worked for a number of media organizations and your work is unique in that you get to interact with so many different kinds of people, so many different entrepreneurs. And so your insights would be particularly interesting. It would be more, you have a bird's eye view of what everything, of everything that is happening. So I'd be curious to know, to see what, what um, gaps do you see in terms of competencies and skills, um, at least in the African market when it comes to, the agribusiness value chain. Um, what what gaps do you see that need to be filled, and how do you how how can you go about it? I know Mr. Okisegere uh, mentioned the whole aspect of communication. Maybe you could also speak very briefly on that. Thank you very very much. I just feel like uh, this is the panel where I belonged because <laughs> as everyone was speaking, we're just 
pointing at, oh, Maggie's here. They need to tell our story. <laughs> and uh, I have to say, uh, it is very important. And uh, for SMEs, I've, I've done quite extensive research, especially uh, in understanding how SMEs will be able to benefit from the AFCFTA. And um, just to give you an example, in 2019, with the BBC, we traveled to Niger to do when the AFCFTA was being ratified. And we met a few uh, entrepreneurs, uh, SMEs in agribusiness, especially. Mm -hmm. And even when we spoke to them and, and you know, say, do you understand the free trade agreement? The answer was, we don't know. I still pay taxes. I still can't cross the border. I still can't do anything. So there was no knowledge. Like they, uh, they absolutely had no idea what was going on. But they, again, like I, I, I keep saying, um, sometimes this, for as a journalist, we, we cannot find everyone. It's it's a huge continent with over a billion people. You have to be intentional about telling your own story. And there are different avenues of telling the story. I mean, you do not expect international media to be able to cover all entrepreneurs or SMEs within Africa. You have to be intentional. You have to start from home. You have to find ways to be able to, to get your product out there. So um, the question of having communication also so, you know, how do we get our story out? I think it's you as an entrepreneur, as an SME, how do I really want to tell my story? And where do I really want to tell it? Because again, if I am going to do it for you, I'm going to reshape your story. And again, it, it might be, it might not be exactly what you want. So I am glad that I actually get to share to at least interact with some of the SMEs. Uh, I've worked in Kenya I'm, I'm currently in Dakar, between Dakar and Kenya, but I also see one of the biggest challenges, especially with entrepreneurs in Africa, is it's, 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 there is a huge market within Africa, but we are again tied to our own homes. Mm -hmm. And men, oftentimes they say, you know, it doesn't, how often do you leave Kenya to cross over to West Africa to see what opportunities in terms of partnerships would be available for you? and even find out what, what is really required or needed. And again, for, for us as journalists or, or storytellers, this is where it comes, we, this is where we come in to, to tell the story that you, know, you can actually cross borders, east to west, south to, you know, to, to the north and, and be able to, to forge partnerships or even to grow your business. So in my own experience, I think, I think a lot of people talk about finance um, from what I've heard from some of the panelists, most of them have talked about uh, communication, uh, you know, the skills and, and all of that. And again, I think with what we've seen even with COVID-19, there's been a chance to reinvent the entire wheel in terms of how we do business, in terms of how we really, uh, especially even in our good business, because a lot has been, has been on standstill. I would even love to know if there was a chance for you to renovate you know, in terms of how you do your business, because logistics was on a, was on a hold for a long time. So I think it's an opportunity. And as we speak of challenges, I wish we could look at them as opportunities. I wish we could look at them as ways of how we can get better. But I am, uh, I am, I am listening harder and I'll be here to re-engage to see how we can help in terms of communicating. But one thing I have to say is that with storytelling or getting your story out there, you have to be intentional about it. You definitely have to be intentional about it. And it doesn't just have to be in the media. It has to be for branding from how you position your product to how you really even have your product in the Kenyan market, not just on the global scale, because again, this is what I say that you, even when you look at the numbers, it's, it's minimal. You'll be shocked how many people watch international TV across the continent. The access is not that as, uh, as much as you would think. So you have to also really think harder. How do you want to get your story out? But it's very important. I think even in the AFCFTA or even in business, if you cannot get your story out, I feel there is always a huge gap. And just to reiterate what Bill Gates said, if he had to spend one dollar, he, he would only spend it on communication. So I think it's important, and um, I'm looking forward to re-engage. That would be my, you know, my addition to what everyone was saying. Because I felt like, yeah, this is where the panel, <laughs> this is the panel probably where I, I belong because I feel like there's a need, and and everyone feels like 
where is the media when it comes to, to pushing our businesses? But where are you in looking for the media? I feel like also, you know, in Africa, there is, there is a sense of, you know, looking at the media, not them. It's, it's important, of course, but I don't think we are intentional uh, as much to be able to, I don't know if we really take it that serious to change an entire narrative. We are, we are not intentional to use it, to be able that we use every communication tool we have, you know, to, to change the narrative, to change our businesses. And I feel like that has to change. Okay, thank you so much for, for talking about us telling our story and um, using whatever tools that are in our, I guess, toolkit, communication tools that are in our, in our, in our bags to, to change the narrative or to tell the narrative, at least from the African perspective. Um, thank you for that particular challenge and for also challenging us to step out and to cross boundaries um, and forge partnerships. Mr. Okisegere, I will be coming back to you shortly where you can possibly, as you conclude, share with us um, ways in which these borders can be crossed um, with, by the simple SME, um, not that this is work that you do professionally. But before we get to you, I'd like favor, I'd like to come back to you. Um, in conclusion, one, I'd like you to share with us how you have gotten your story out, because you did get your story out um, to be where you are right now. Um, and also in conclusion, I'd like you to share maybe one, at most two things, we are running out of time, on how you think either the academia, academia or the government can better support the SMEs to um, I guess to take advantage of this African continental uh, continental free trade area that is coming up. All right, thank you very much. Um, uh, those, those are very interesting aspects close to heart. So I'll, I'll go back a bit um, to what um, Maggie Mutesi mentioned. So um, one of the programs I've been working on are working with startups. And over the last few years um, with the team I'm working with myself, and a few others at Strathmore, we've worked with over 200 startups and we've gotten some of them featured on the KTN, um, on KTN through the Innovator Show. And the ones that we had the privilege to showcase were the ones who had proven their technology and proven their niche, proven their impact. And those are the ones we showcased. So touching on what Madam Mag Maggie Mutesi mentioned that, you know, what's your niche? What's your voice? What are you trying to push out? What are you doing beyond just being a business? And that's one thing that resonates with me because we had the privilege of being on the KCB lines then um, in 2018. And one thing that really stood out for us is we didn't get to be there. And even the process in which we went to get there, not because we were manufacturing, not because we were young, not because we had a great product, but because not only did we pursue all three, but we pursued as many opportunities as possible. And then that's a really, really important aspect for SMEs to look at, that it's not just about selling your product, making your product, you know, being in spaces, but really pushing it. I remember when the first time Madam Eunice Mudoni had our product, which was in 2017 at SBS, um, it was in an SME forum and uh, we just got to talk and then she tried the sauce and <clears throat> bought from us. And it's, it's about pushing the barriers, pushing boundaries as hard as possible. Um, tying into the next aspect you mentioned with the AFCFTA and even what um, Davy Ngugi mentioned, this is an interesting um, platform for Africans and SMEs because through um, opportunities in terms of logistics, like in the space where Davy Ngugi is and e-commerce and payments, what can end up happening is um, a one, an SME could be based in Nairobi and they could listen a platform like you could talk of a regional platform like Jumia and with effective um, infrastructure logistics, they could be selling to a customer in Nigeria. But with the AFCFTA, what that also means is if, I, if we as Mochaka get a distributor in Namibia, um, we're able to effectively not only access that market, but leverage off of reduced tariffs or no tariffs, depending on the market, um, and also be able to re um, leverage on aspects like, you know, when um, earlier on there was a discussion on the rules of origin during the keynote speech, with such aspects, what can end up happening is even our compliance can be standardized so that when I'm selling in Namibia, I don't have to have some international regulation, but the standards that are being effectively considered across Africa are unified. So when you look, when you talk of, for instance, the CAB standards, they're they're brought down in by by numbers and names into categories. So that when you're saying 
food processing, organic food processing for sauces that are using garlic, ginger, and chili. The standard is the same in Kenya, Nigeria, South Africa, um, Rwanda, so that as I'm producing and I'm trying to enter these markets, it's easy and effective. The second thing also is when, when, when you talk about trade financing, it means that if, because uh, this is a major challenge we faced here in Kenya, a lot of the businesses that we try to approach to sell product want to take product on credit, right? And that's a major challenge for us because for an SME, cash is king because you're paying your suppliers a lot of the time in cash, you're paying your staff a lot of the times in cash, and sometimes it's a wage basis, especially when you need more hands. So trade financing means that if a business in Congo needs um, 300 kilos or a ton of mochaka, it means that they can access the trade financing to initiate the deal. We can access the trade financing to do whatever value addition needs to be done to deliver. And then the settlement of each can happen, whether through the same financing or as a business is able to make payments. So these are things that the AFCFT can really unlock. And when you look at Africa in terms of the member states, just I, I love to look at the US because it means that if I'm selling in Kenya and I'm trying to get to Ghana, it's just as easy as someone selling in Texas and manufacturing in Texas and selling the US. Meaning that's when that's the full scale um, potential of the AFCFK that is easy and seamless across borders. So, yeah. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, Maggie, I, I think you, you wanted to respond uh, to something yeah, I that think, was said. Yeah, I think he said he, when he talked about the work they did at Ketina, I just wanted to point out that Oftentimes you will see startups raise uh, even as low as $1 million and the story will be big. And of course the face on that startup rarely is as an SME in Africa. And I'm really sorry to say this, it will be backed up by a foreign company. It will be a foreign startup and the noise will be made globally. And I feel like that in any way, even as an investor in my shoes, there's a way it motivates you to, to put in money if you had to. And you will see other African startups doing amazing things. And I always meet them. And the first thing I usually say is, how come I've never seen this? I've never seen it anywhere. Or they will raise money and they won't even talk about it. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to say, yeah, that it's, it's very common. It's very, even, even when companies continue raising millions of dollars, even when stories keep going around, most of these startups are not African owned startups. And that gap, I think uh, it comes, it's a challenge to, to the SME founders, especially on this panel, and those that are really watching, they have to really step out of that box and be intentional about you know, getting the news out there or even getting their businesses out there. That's what I wanted to add on what he said. And it's, it's a very common example. It's something common even today. If you read in papers somewhere, you will mm -hmm. see a startup that has raised some millions of dollars, but it won't be really an African startup. Okay, thank you very much for that. I will be coming back to you shortly um, for maybe you could share with us one or two practical ways that an SME um, could possibly get their story out there without necessarily waiting for the big media houses to make the noise about it. Um, maybe one or two suggestions of how they could practically do that. In the meantime, though, Davy, maybe you could share with us. Um, I know you have been sharing with us the support that you are giving in, in bridging the skills or competency gaps that are there in terms of getting to the market. Um, I'd like you to one, I guess, give a closing statement on that particular issue, but I'd also like you to comment on what additional support you think the government could provide in, in terms of bridging this particular skill gap and also academia, if, if you do have something to share on that. Hey, so I think I'll, I'll start with the, the gap. Um, for most of uh, the small businesses, uh, some of the biggest challenges tend to be on issues of uh, matters taxation and matters uh, policies, um, where maybe there are restrictions to as to what maybe products you can export out of the country, or maybe what maybe inputs you're able to bring in. Um, and then things like taxation, where you find taxation can be quite punitive because you might find there are a lot of uh, add-on taxes. So you have one tax when you're bringing, say, an input, maybe you're bringing in uh, things like fertilizers, and then there's a tax on it. And then over and above that, you find you expected maybe to add the uh, VAT and you have excise taxes and many other small taxes. So that by the time, uh, 
company is able to be able to just get the product out there. It's really so expensive that either it's not acceptable in the market at that particular price point, or maybe the product is uh, just not viable anymore for the market. Uh, the other thing is uh, in terms of policies, policies that encourage uh, a lot of businesses to be able to just transact. Uh, if the government was to uh, put proper regulation in terms of uh, how companies are able to consume products just internally, that would create a very big impact. Uh, you find uh, small scale farmers, uh, let's say even farmers who are doing things like uh, bananas. You find there are a lot of imports uh, of bananas. You find maybe bananas coming all the way from places like uh, Brazil, uh, food brands like Chiquita. And the kind of banana they are bringing in is Cavendish, which is a banana that is quite largely grown in Kenya. And if that banana was to, you know, if the government was to put a policy in a place where if the country is able to produce this kind of product, then you shouldn't have to, you shouldn't allow it to come through an export, I mean, through an import. So those are some of the things that I think the government can do to just support the SMEs that are in agribusiness. Uh, the other thing would maybe be having uh, more broadband coverage, uh, more affordable internet for the places where maybe you find, uh, you know, more hubs that can have maybe even free internet to the community around so that most of these small entrepreneurs are uh, uh, like uh, Favor was mentioning, he was able to get a lot of assistance through the Mogota place. And that was because he's able to access a lot of facilities that would have previously cost him money, but he's able to get them at either no cost or at very minimal subsidized cost. So having places where the government is able to subsidize the cost, that would play a very big role. In terms of academia, I think, one of the things that has always stood out to me has been uh, the level or maybe the kind of curricula that is able to be provided. Um, and I think one of the places that I actually applaud for what they do is uh, Strathmore because Strathmore has very updated courses and updated coursework. Some of the things that people get to learn in institutions can be quite outdated. And by the time you have the knowledge and you're getting out to the market, you find that even by the time you're graduating, you're already too old, whatever is expected of you. So mm -hmm. it's important that a lot of educational institutions should update their curricula to meet with the demands and also the advancement in technology for all needs. So that most of these people who want to go into entrepreneurship are able then to get in with knowledge that is already useful for them at a point when they're leaving uh, the education institution. And in conclusion, um, I think it's important that for most of these businesses, um, as you're presenting your business out there, one of the things that we are always teaching SMEs is the importance of proper branding, being able to present your business, your product in a way that is appealing to the customer, in a way that sells the product for you to the customer, that the customer can understand what the value that this product is going to give me over the other products in the market, that makes a very huge impact. Something as simple uh, without mentioning, but there are places where you go supermarkets that, that buy farm produce and you find like say potatoes, they would clean the potatoes, get the bad of the potato. And just by doing something as simple as that, the price of that kg of potato just goes up, could be double or even triple the, the cost. So just being able to brand and prepare, package your product nicely for the market, that is going to add a lot of value into the product that you're able to sell. And uh, finally, as a platform, Anzil is there to be able to support all these businesses um, to sign up and begin selling online quite easily. Uh, if they need to sign up, uh, anzili.com is the, the website and they can get on there Get your shop up and running, start selling across not only on your own shop but also on Facebook, uh, through marketplaces. And we open up a whole world for you and a whole market for you that you're able to access. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I'm sure this information is in your bio, but feel free to drop the website link in the chat. Um, I know there are a number of people who are actually looking at the chat, and so it could be an, an immediate way of sharing that information. Now, as we hear OJ talking to us about how we can cross borders, 
and hearing his final thoughts on the kind of support that would be very helpful from the government and from academia. Um, if there are any questions, please put them in the chat um, or in the question and answer section. We will get to them if possible, um, or we will respond to them in the course of, of, of this particular conference. So OJ, final remarks. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I just want to say one thing um, or a few things. One, I want to reemphasize that we must know what we have, mm -hmm. what we want to sell out, whether product or whether it's a service. We must package it in the right way. And we must be able to ensure that whatever we put in the market, there will be consistency because nobody buys the market. For, for example, when it comes to products, when you establish and you put your product in the marketplace, people want to buy it every day. So if you're not able to supply, do not go and excite people and then you're not able to get it up. When it comes to a variety that we want to put in a farm, it's just good to start small and build it up and be resilient and consistent and persistent until you break it up. And I say it again, let's not go into unnecessary competition because that is what these SMEs do. They wake up today, they think they want to become the giant tomorrow. It doesn't work that way. People buy a brand. You have to model yourself and grow and consistently be able to upscale and upskill. Um, but when it comes to government, I want to say this government has been very proactive. Information is available, but we still have to break certain glass ceilings because business and information is still within some silos. In some places people don't even know when you go to Caps, where do I start from? A departmental say then go come back go come back it, it, it's sometimes very frustrating if i need to get something that i'm in mandera why will i have to come to nairobi for example how fast can it be handled within the county levels those functions must be devolved to function to county levels and there's need for partnership between the national government and the county governments in terms of building capacity of the people within down there so that we people can walk into, into the county offices and get the same services. But on the other side, I want to say this to academia and I address the academia specifically. Let's not be in the ancient when we are dealing with the current. The industry is moving faster by day. Innovations are coming quickly. It is good that the academia connects with the business community to get to know what happens because things change every day. I take an example of the fresh produce industry. Uh, the, the way the, 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 the industry works is about every minute counts and changes come out that we must be very quick to adopt. And I can tell you for free, we want to hire candidates that leave college today but we have to become a training ground to bring them on board that's not what we want we want a ready somebody ready fit for purpose unfortunately we are not able to get fit for purpose we still have to take them through a training and yet we are available to share knowledge and experience with you you can call us we'll talk to you we'll talk to your people we'll prepare them two years three years one year before they get out of college what it means being out here fit for purpose. Then in terms of um, the Kenyans, the Africans, stop this cowardice mentality and the selfish mentality of thinking this is mine. I've just come in from the, I've just come in from Middle East now. The market is so big. The market is looking for, we are looking for, they're looking for products. The market is so big, they are looking for products, but we are very inconsistent in our supply. We don't even know what they require. We are still using packages of 20, of, of 19, 19, 90, 19. I mean, it's, it's, it's no longer that way. The world has gone tech. They can actually get a traceability system. And I'm, sure, I'm happy that the IT teams are here. We need to find out how we can incorporate technology into our, our supplies. We need to be open. We need to be, we need to open up the space, this power in consolidation. Then I want to say this, knock, Continue pushing until you break through. This issue of SMEs giving up along the way, collapsing on the year three, collapsing in year five is an issue. And Strathmore, I want to address you. It's important to get people to know what kind of business they're getting into it. The research, the business proposal, the practical way of running businesses. This thing of access to finance is at all order because the financial is institutions want you to give them statements. The startups do not have statements to give you. They don't have collateral. 
we need to work out on how we can demystify certain things and how we can get access to market, which is easier. For government, regulations are good, but unfortunately, the government of the, the governments in Africa are too rigid. So we need to influence. And I can tell you from where we sit, we've been able to influence certain things and the law is clear and therefore there's need for us to continue engaging. What is, not, what is missing is that the academia lives in academia, the industry is in our industry, the government is on the other side and they all purport to be working for the same country or for mm -hmm. the same continent. There's need for us to break down. Last but not least, do not fear standards. Packaged products may require a label because they have to go through a processing. The fresh produce does not require caps. It requires a different standard in the different places, different on the market. So let's not fear standards. Standards is the language for business in the world today. Compliance is the business. Compliance is what everybody reasons about. Compliance is what gets you to get to any market. And there's no small person, there's no big person. As long as you comply with the standard that market requires, whether it's in America, whether it's anywhere, it will happen. And what government is doing now and what we have done with government is that we partnered with government in opening up certain markets so that we are fit and ready for that market. So I could speak about this subject matter so passionately, I'm available to talk about it. I'm available to get you to do the domestic market in terms of your fresh produce industry, including the export, including the African free trade area. We are available to do all this. All I'm saying is that let's not wait until such a conference for us to work. Organize forums with your students, with your people. Call us, we'll come and talk to them and expose it. But in terms of the media, I am so happy because we've worked with the media. I don't have a problem with the media. Thanks, Maggie. I don't have a problem with the media. I access the media in Kenya, but nobody gave me a platform. I had to push my way in. So there's power in consistency and continuing pursuing your passion without fear of contradiction because nobody will give it to you, you must break through. I want to say this. Thank you for the opportunity, but want to say we are not going to tire up until every person in the face of the earth has food on the table. So there's an opportunity. The only place you can be is in agriculture because you must feed. Because even after here, we're going to eat and there must be men and women available to be in the farms. So the okay. next video in Kenya is about, the girls in Africa is about um, a farmer and somebody in agribusiness and the rest can follow. Thank you. Thank you so much, OJ, for that um, very passionate conclusion on your part. Maggie, last words? Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, he has said, everyone has said literally everything, but I have to f finalize with this uh, for storytelling. Uh, storytelling is not just about uh, KTN, CNN, BBC, no, storytelling is, is, is broad. Mm -hmm. And I think for as a startup or as an SME, you need to put a budget aside for communications. And that could be, you know, running your social media or even getting somebody specifically to create for you an entire strategy of how to communicate your product. So do not take it for granted. But I also have to say that please take um, advantage of exhibitions, take advantage of uh, conferences. There is the huge Dubai conference that is just happening. And I know a lot of countries or entrepreneurs that have been all over the place I got excited too that I felt like I should have been there. So these are things you need to take advantage of, but they also come, come with a cost because you have to travel, you have to, to put in money to be able to communicate. So do not, do not take it for granted. You have to be intentional about it. With the media, again, I have to say, the media is not it all. Even music itself is storytelling. So find ways that work for your product. Find ways that work for your products and for your customers. And your first investor is your customer. So work on your product. Even when you go to your, the media and you have all the attention, you get, you get all the slots. If your product is not good enough, you're not able to sustain those, those customers. So your first investor, your first audience, your first everybody is your customer. Work on the product and put aside a budget for communication. I don't know how much I can emphasize this, I'm running a startup myself too, but I think I spend more on communication than I spend on anything else. So it's, it's, it's something you have to look into. Thank you. Thank you so much. Viva, I see your hand is up uh, briefly. Yeah, thank you. So maybe just to touch on the aspect, I, I realized I didn't get to share on the, how the university and government plug in to the 
to really contributing and transforming the space. I think one easy aspect that Strathmore could leverage on would be a knowledge hub that could be virtual, right? So it could be a portal or a section within your website where you aggregate all these ecosystem players. So if it's banks that you've worked with on different programs on trade financing, you know, it could be pages where you show how to qualify, how to register. <clears throat> if it's sections on like, leveraging on government resources for SMEs. So it could be a not just a knowledge hub where like it really acts like a repository. So it's based on just like Mr. Kisagere mentioned, if you are driven, you'll find it, but there's a platform that allows for them to find it. Because again, if you know businesses don't get to do the footwork, they wouldn't know. But it's easy for an entity that already has the knowledge and the competency to access it and the networks. Um, another thing that now the government could do is either do that themselves where they already know as a government, this is what's there. This is what's possible. Um, these are um, trade programs that or, or trade deals that are in discussion, and these are the opportunities that it gets to unlock. So it could be as simple as you know a platform that the government has that's a blog that lets SMEs know, and it could even you know be integrated with social media, so there it feeds it feeds right into their feed. Right. So I don't need to check the website. It's right on Twitter. So very small things that could be really transformative, because imagine if I were growing chili and I didn't know about value addition, then I realized that there are all these opportunities. These are things I'd explore. And then other things would be more courses and more platforms for SMEs um, and open forums for panel discussions like this. So thank you. OK, thank you so much for your engagement. I have learned and heard so much that um, I'm hoping that has been helpful to also the entrepreneurs who've been tuned in. Um, there's been emphasis on trade financing, there has been emphasis on just um, the government helping with the taxations and the policies and coming up with regulations that protect our markets and our, our, our I guess, our industry as, as, a, as, a, as an African continent and also in our respective countries. Um, I have heard Consistency, consistency, consistency um, is very, very crucial for you to actually um, succeed in business. And of course, resilience, yeah? Um, not giving up along the way. And of course, effective and efficient sharing of information. I like the suggestion that um, has come up in terms of having a central place where information can be shared. Um, I hadn't actually ever thought really about the universities being the place where such kind of very practical information for entrepreneurs could be, but that's a very good idea. Um, we are coming up with an SME center and maybe that's one of the things we should consider doing as a university, but definitely yes. the government should also take lead in that. Um, thank you so much for the discussions on communication. I, I am a marketer, so it sounds as though we are actually not doing enough in training people on how to put their stories out there to create effective brands. Um, maybe we do need um, I guess practical executive education sessions where we can have entrepreneurs come in and we can arm them with information and skills in, in how they can better shine their light brightly in this world. So thank you so much to the panelists. You've done such an amazing job of, of, of talking about these issues. It's just the beginning of the discussion. Um, and the breakout rooms that we'll be getting into will be delving even deeper into those particular discussions. And for those of you who haven't been able to speak, this is the opportunity for you to join those breakout room discussions because that is where we get to hear your voices and possibly even your comments based on these panels that you have been hearing us have today. So thank you very much, Martin. Over back to you.